Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are logging on in the world and welcome to this latest Friday morning, because that's where we are uh, in the UK, a webinar from Infrastructure Intelligence. Sorry about that slight delay in starting off today. Uh, we had uh, some gremlins on the IT, but frank uh, thankfully they're all sorted out now. My name's Andy Walker, I'm the editor of Infrastructure Intelligence. And I think today's uh, event uh, well, all of our events are very interesting, but this one is particularly interesting and, dare I say, particularly topical as well, because we're looking at the future of transport, particularly in the aftermath of the uh, of the COVID crisis. But I think it's particularly re relevant, uh, given uh, recent um, reviews, reports from the government, the announcement of the Williams Review on Rail quite recently, and also a lot of talk about the future of uh, the transport system in the UK as we come out of the uh, the pandemic, because as we all know, uh, the way in which we've used transport over the course of the last, what, 16 months now, isn't it, uh, has definitely altered somewhat and will probably change even further uh, going into the future. And that's before we start talking about the ongoing issues of net zero, concerns about sustainability, where we are with um, electric vehicles, uh, and so on and so forth. So I'm hoping that uh, today's event will be extremely informative and hopefully uh, very interesting. We've got an excellent panel, as always, for you uh, at the webinar today. Um, we've got uh, Mike Batherham from Atkins. We've got David Clark from the Railway Industries Associ Industry Association. We've got Katie Holland, who's a past president of Women in Transport. Paul Wilkes from the Fleet Operator Recognition Scheme. Uh, and also Jamie Gordon, uh, a Director for Infrastructure and Energy at BECG. Uh, so hopefully a lot of uh, insight and a lot of knowledge there to help us on our way uh, for today's uh, webinar. Uh, without further ado, uh, we'll kick off with our first speaker. Just before we do, a, a reminder that if you do have any questions, please post them in the chat. If you want to put your organisation slash company name in there as well, feel free. Always happy to give people a mention on these Friday morning sessions. Um, and in, indeed, if you wanna have a conversation with anyone in the chat, again, feel free again, I'm sure uh, our panelists uh, are, are more than willing to engage uh, in conversation uh, as, uh, as well. Anyway, uh, without further ado from me, our first speaker is Mike uh, Batherham, who's a growth director at Atkins. Uh, Mike is uh, vastly experienced uh, in, the, uh, in the transport sector and is very used to working with different stakeholders, politicians, uh, clients, and he's worked on many large civil transportation uh, projects, both in the public and the private sector. And I, for one, am very looking forward to hearing what he has to say about where we're going to be going with transport uh, in the future. So, uh, Mike, the floor is yours. OK, thank you, uh, Andy. Uh, thanks for the introduction and good morning, everyone, um, for those that are in the UK and afternoon and so on for those that are outside. Uh, so I've been asked today really just to uh, share thoughts on uh, key areas that we need to focus on over the next 12 months. And from my perspective, and I think the three key areas are digital, diversity and inclusion and net zero. As an industry, we've talked a lot about these topics in 2020. And now we need to accelerate our actions and make more tangible progress in 2021. So in respect to digital, I was hugely impressed and I'm sure everybody on this call um, was with the great resilience and tenacity of our people have showed in the wake of COVID. Most notably, a marked acceleration in the adoption of technology which made the transition to remote working much easier and far more effective than many could have ever have imagined. Our infrastructure insights survey of 400 senior decision makers showed that 95% believe that digital innovation will be increasingly important after COVID. With broad consensus that the effective adoption of digital enabled ways of working will be crucial to accelerate growth. In fact, only increased government spending was deemed more critical in this regard. So COVID presents us with once in a generation opportunity to fix some of the country's most long-standing problems, most notably leveling up regional disparity and improving productivity levels, which have been holding us back for decades. COVID has shown us that attitudes and behaviors can change quickly. Artificial intelligence can inform decision-making. 
Too often decisions have been delayed in the past through over-consideration and through fear of getting it wrong. This adds additional costs and months and years to programs. So benchmarks, predictive analytics, machine learning, and use of artificial intelligence can all help inform our approach and make these decisions easier and more assured. Our data analytics work, our development of digital twins and our use of them to help us deliver complex programs is built upon trust. Trust in our data and trust in the analysis of this data. We can produce digital twins that can cope with mixed quality data and with significant complexity at the same time and still produce high quality trusted analysis. I'd highly recommend everybody on this call uh, to have a look at the article by Matt Peck on trusted data and digital twins. That's available on, on our SNC Labelin website. So now to diversity and inclusion. At Atkins, diversity and inclusion is top of our agenda. Real tangible actions are being taken in Atkins, like the appointment of the Clear Company to steer our EDNI journey and strategy into the next year. We have made great strides with more work underway, creating a culture where diverse talent can thrive. Discrimination is eliminated. We're supporting policies and processes that create an environment where all of our people can thrive. We have nothing to lose and everything to gain by putting our money where our mouth is and delivering on diversity and inclusion. Having come in from a less than privileged background, I'm pleased to see this. Skills is also a huge part of this, recognising and embracing the fact that engineering now requires a different set of skills to 10 or even five years ago. It means that we can attract a more diverse range of people. My colleague, Joe Moffat, has written an interesting article in the Global Rail Review on closing the skill gaps and improving diversity in rail. That's definitely worthwhile having a read. From climate change to the information age, now is a critical time for us to innovate and change the way we do things. So that's holding. So what's holding us back from putting innovation into action? In the recent Atkins LinkedIn poll, 45% of our followers said that the biggest barrier to innovation within our industry is our people and culture. As an industry, we can play an increasing role in tackling economic inequality. The Procurement Policy Note 620 on social value recognises that through the delivery of public sector contracts, employment opportunities can be created for those that face barriers to employment or live in deprived areas. By doing so, we can help the transport sector to address the skills gap and at the same time enable, enable people from the most disadvantaged communities to secure recognised qualifications and progress within our industry, increasing the long-term socio-economic diversity of our workforce. In relation to net zero, our priority should be enabling and accelerating the delivery of green infrastructure. These include electrification of the railway, bringing in more energy efficient trains, active travel schemes and future mobility projects that integrate demand responsive transport and connected and autonomous vehicles. To address global warming will require the behaviour of every person and their transport choices in particular to change. We are all going to need to need to make significant different travel choices to achieve net zero. And only by connecting with transport users and gaining insight into their behaviours can we create a truly sustainable transport system. As COVID has shifted society and how it works, the rule book was rewritten in 2020. Luckily, our ability to gather data gives us more knowledge about how transport is being used than ever before. To help reshape choices as we emerge into our new normal, we need real-time data to better inform customers. Incentivization plays an important role in those shifting behaviours and in the development of lower pollution solutions. We need to consider how we better incentivise the uptake of greater transport solutions and also disincentivise the use of more polluting modes of transport. We may shy away from the concept of disincentivising, but if we think back to the smoking ban, and how effective that was accepted by society so we can see the impact it can have on creating change in making it stick. It's definitely worth reading uh, Lizzie Stewart, our uh, MD for Transportation's uh, article on how climate change and COVID-19 can challenge us to behave differently. That's uh, in the rail engineer. So in conclusion, for me, one of the largest challenges we face is whether we continue to set our collective sites on returning to normal, having deconstructed our sector, adapted our delivery models, collaborated like never before, 
how do we use COVID as a reset button? The William Shapps Review, the National Bus Strategy and Change Gear, uh, the National Cycling and Walking Strategy provides tantalising glimpses of a new, more sustainable future. We have a once in a lifetime opportunity to redefine what normal looks like together as an industry. The chance to rebuild with purpose and vision, locking in the collaborative behaviours, the agility and focus that's been so evident during 2020. The opportunity is here for the leaders of our sector to work together like never before to transform the way we design, build and operate our transport system. Let's all make sure that this opportunity does not slip through our fingers. Thank you very much. And now over to Dave Clark. Well, I'll introduce Dave Clark in a minute, just to, just yes. to say, um, I'll, I'll introduce the, um, the, um, the speakers. Uh, thanks very much for that, Mike. Yes. It was interesting uh, what you were saying there about uh, the linkages really with uh, diversity and inclusion. Obviously the, you know, the very strong net zero link in relation to transport, which I'm sure will come out in the conversation later on. And not for the first time at an infrastructure intelligence uh, webinar, we've heard the importance of data uh, mentioned uh, as well, which I think is really crucial going forward. And especially when we're looking at the usage of uh, transport systems, it's really, uh, it's really, uh, you know, really important. But I'm sure we'll come back to some of those points uh, a little bit uh, later on. Just, uh, just to welcome those who've uh, joined uh, this infrastructure intelligence webinar uh, this morning. A little bit late. Uh, you're very welcome. Um, the latest in our Friday uh, webinars organized in association with the strategic communications partner BECG, um, hoping for a really good discussion this morning on the issue of the future of transport. Our next speaker, and Mike mentioned the Williams Review there, so uh, teed him up quite nicely, is David Clark, who's a technical director at the Railway Industry uh, Association, who, if my inbox is anything to go by, must be one of the most active trade associations uh, in the uh, infrastructure sector. They've always got something to say on behalf of their members. Uh, David is a chartered engineer with more than 30 years uh, rail industry experience and is really at the cutting edge of a lot of the um, uh, discussions that are taking place in the industry at the moment with many of his members as well. So I can't think of anyone better really uh, in many ways to talk about the future of transport. David, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Andy, and thank you for that introduction. Um, just to say, I totally support Mike's uh, three priorities, digital, uh, net zero, and of course, diversity. I'm, I'm going to talk about digital and net zero as I go on, but just to say with diversity, uh, we're really pleased and proud of the EDI charter that we launched with Women in Rail last year. We've got over 160 organizations signed up to that, including yours, Mike, uh, and many others. Um, and just the, uh, it, it's, you know, absolutely the right thing to do, but, uh, uh, you know, we're really bowled over by uh, the, the, you know, the, the response and support of, across the industry for that. Um, so, so turning to the sort of topic of the day, um, as an organization, RIA's optimistic about recovery. We're optimistic about recovery of uh, the rail industry, uh, the pa passengers, uh, traffic. Freight has already already recovered, but we, we are um, not universally supported in that. You know, there's, there's, there's a certain amount of negativity um, about uh, recovery, and there's um, um, a lot of conversation about, well, will people come back to work? Uh, won't they just, um, uh, you know, sort of work remotely, use use uh, virtual conferencing as we are doing today? Um, we think over time people are going to come back. Uh, we think, you know, business is done by and, and socializing is done face to face. And, you know, we're essentially a social uh, um, a social uh, race as humans and uh I, th I think that's going to come back. It may take some time. Uh, people, uh, it'll take some time to, for people to build build up uh, um, uh, confidence. But uh, the rail, the rail industry and public transport generally is safe. There's no, you know, there's no evidence at all that it's been anything other than safe, even during the height of the pandemic. Um, it's just worth highlighting that I think there's absolutely a 
key uh, late demand to travel. I was looking at the latest statistics and uh, basically roads have recovered. Um, in fact, more than recovered. In, if you talk about light commercial and HGV, they're more than 100% of the level that they were before, uh, before COVID. That and cars are at 97%. That su suggests to me there's a late demand to travel. I think we would all quite like to go on our holidays this year and we're quite likely to, to go on them in the UK rather than further afield. Um, so I think there's a, there's a huge pent up demand. Uh, and so for those that are saying uh, things like uh, rail industry demand is gonna be substantially down over a period of years, uh, we disagree and actually we'd say it's too early to make decisions. Um, in every previous um, uh, in every previous um, uh, situation where where um, traffic has fallen, whether it's two thousand and eight or uh, or other economic uh, uh, interruptions, it's recovered. Rail is already back to forty five percent. Transport for London's back to forty percent, and buses are back to sixty two percent. So why start making decisions about long-term decisions about investment uh, uh, until you've seen for six or 12 months how things are going to recover? Um, but just looking back into the, uh, into the pandemic, um, I'm really, really proud um, to be part of an industry that I think has pulled together really, really well during, during that crisis for, for the country. Uh, we help keep key workers and, and, and goods moving. Um, freight has been, a, you know, an absolute stalwart for UK PLC during during the crisis. Uh, there's huge support for the industry from the government, which we've been uh, extremely supportive of, and um, the clients have been brilliant. It's not often you hear a uh, supplier trade association say that, is it? But the the clients have been absolutely brilliant. Particularly, Network Rail stepped in behind the uh, client uh, behind the supply chain with things like a early prompt payment and very practical ways to keep us uh, working as an industry and. As a very safety focused industry, we very quickly put in place all the measures to allow, uh, whether it was work sites on the track or whether it was factories building trains to get back to work. And I think we did that better than some other industries. And at one point in time, 25% of all construction in the UK was rail construction, um, which just shows how well we did in, in, uh, in, in get in building back uh, be, even during the even during the the uh, continuing crisis um so we set out during being a bit concerned about some of the um, slightly negative language we highlighted 10 reasons why the uk should continue to invest in rail rail's a long-term game if you stop investing now, that that comes back to bite you when traffic has recovered in the future. Um, and we're talking about very long term assets. You know, trains last 30, 40 years. Infrastructure assets last uh, 100 plus years. As I've already said, we think the, the reduction in passenger numbers is temporary. Uh, it's recovered on every other of the previous occasion. Why wouldn't it now? The pattern might change. There might be less commuting, but I would argue there'd probably be a lot more leisure. It's not just for passengers. Freight, as I said, has uh, done extremely well during the pandemic. And if we look to decarbonisation and net zero, rails, the most useful thing rail can do is modal shift, particularly around freight, because rail is unique as a transport mode. We actually know how to decarbonise. We have the technology to decarbonise. HGVs don't yet know how to decarbonise. So let's put let's put as much as possible road freight onto uh, onto electric railways. Investment in in uh, in rail benefits the whole of the UK. We're a network. Uh, the suppliers are spread around the UK. The network spread around the UK. And in a build uh, in a, in in a, a scenario where we're trying to uh, um, to rebalance, rail is a really good way to help do that. You can't easily mothball rail once you've to once you've tried to sh sh shut it. You know to to turn it off. You can't turn it back on very easily. Um, more positively, uh, we did some uh, economic analysis uh, about eighteen months, two years ago, and we found that for every one pound you spend on the rail network, you get two pound twenty social value in the wider in the wider economy. Um, 
and you ca you can't actually wait. Uh, we would say must the, actually there's been a number of delays with rail investment. And if we're going to meet the, our decarbonisation and digitalisation targets, we've got quite a bit to do in the next 29 years around decarbonisation. And if you save a tonne of carbon now, you've saved 29 tonnes by the time you get to 2050. If you wait till 2049, you only save a tonne. So let's just get on with it. And there's a clear window to get work done. Actually, let's make the most of passenger numbers being down for, for temporarily. Let's just get on and, and uh, improve our railways. Um, so I, those, are, those are our key priorities at the moment. Um, I'll hand back to Andy. Thanks very much, uh, David, for those um, points. And interesting uh, to hear you arguing for a long-term view, which is obviously, is definitely something that's needed um, in all transport, really, at the end of the day, but I think particularly relevant uh, to the rail sector and, and, and also following that up when you said about uh, using this, I suppose, interregnum or, you know, slight hiatus in people's usage to actually get, you know, those, you know, those jobs done uh, on the network. Um, obviously, the government uh, are coming out with quite a raft of announcements at the moment, and we'll probably go into that uh, in the conversation as well. Um, also, I interested to hear your comments on uh, HGVs. I could, I could see Paul Wilkes chomping at the bit to come in there, but he'll have his chance uh, shortly uh, to talk about, um, um, you know, transport in, in, in sort of the construction sort of fleet sector as well, which is an often overlooked um, um, sector of transport, but very important for our industry uh, because of the amount of uh, goods that are actually going to and from sites and uh, and elsewhere. But anyway, as I say, Paul will have his chance uh, shortly. Our next speaker um, is uh, Katie Hulland, who is the um, past president of the Women in Transport uh, Group, and as well as being uh, past president of the Women in Transport Group, uh, an excellent organisation, by the way, if you're not aware of it, Go online and find out about it, support it, uh, sponsor it, join it. Um, it's a, a really good uh, organisation in the sector. Katie is also a director at Turner and Townsend, working on strategy and transformation within the firm's programme advisory team. She's someone else with vast experience of the transport sector with over 17 years um, uh, experience uh, in the uh, in the industry. So again, someone whose insights, I think, will be very illuminating. Katie, over to you. Oh, thanks very much, Andy. And uh, yeah, good morning, afternoon and evening, everyone. Um, um, yes, so as I said, um, I'm the past president of Women in Transport, but only by a week. Uh, we're very lucky to have appointed uh, Jo Field as our new president. So she's very sorry that she couldn't be here today. Um, but uh, we said we decided it was all right with just a week's overlap, then uh, we, we think hopefully I'm still on top of the re recent relevant topics. So, uh, um, so thank you very much. Thanks also to, uh, to Andy and Chetner and the, the team at um, Intelligent, um, uh, Infrastructure Intelligence. Um, you've done a huge amount of work helping us to, um, to fly the flag for our cause, which we really, really appreciate. Um, and, uh, and it really helps to raise our profile. So today I just wanted to um, give you kind of uh, just th three sort of key areas that I wanted to touch on. As firstly, just to give you a bit of an update on the current progress of, uh, of gender diversity in the transport sector. Um, we released an, uh, uh, an important report earlier this year um, uh, with the APPG for Women in Transport. Also like to explain to you why we believe gender diversity is important for the transport sector to build back much, much better from the devastating impact that COVID-19 has had. And then also as well, what would women in transport like to see as our future of the, uh, as the, tra of the transport sector? So first of all, just touching briefly on our gender perceptions report 2021. Um, so this has been a really critical milestone for us as an organisation. Um, uh, on International Women's Day earlier this year, um, as I said, with the all party parliamentary group for women in transport, for which we're the secretariat. Um, we launched our first ever white paper um, and survey calling on government to challenge macho behaviours and culture in the transport workplace. It was a survey of 567 transport industry professionals and it showed that over two thirds, 69% of women, 
felt that the transport industry had a macho culture. 70% of women also perceived the industry to have an image problem. But more alarmingly, 70% of the women surveyed said that they'd experienced discriminatory behaviour and language, including derogatory or sexist remarks, jokes and statements targeted at them. The survey highlighted statistically significant differences in women's uh, and men's perception of gender issues working while in transport. And women felt that they'd experienced more discriminat uh, discriminatory behaviour than men feeling that they had witnessed it. So despite reporting somewhat negative experiences of industry culture, the women's survey were overwhelmingly proud to work in the transport sector at 83%, and 85% were likely to recommend a transport career to other women. So with women making up 47% of the workforce, yet frustratingly, progress in gender representation in transport remains very static. It's barely moved from its 20% representation um, uh, since we've been uh, following the data for at least the past five years. This is further compounded in the modes with only 6% of pilots, 6.5% of bus drivers, 8% of rail engineers being women. And the recently released William Shapps plan for rail policy paper cited a male rail workforce of 87%. So we really believe that gender diversity is important for the transport sector to build back better. Following the devastating impact that COVID-19 has had on our lives, the economy and passenger levels, we know that we will need to invest and grow our transport systems and infrastructure. A recent report from the National Skills Academy for Rail estimated that roughly 120,000 additional people will need to enter the rail industry alone in the next 10 years to keep trains running and deliver on new projects. And this is repeated across all the transport sector modes as our population grows and focus on sustainable travel increases. The failure to attract, retain and recruit women into the industry will leave a huge untapped pool of potential resource and it will prohibit and starve the industry of the innovation and collaboration it really needs to recover. So what would women in transport like to see as the future of transport? Actually, our ask is really simple. We'd like to see a transport workforce that from planning through to construction and into operation is truly representative of the customers that it serves and paid, and paid fairly to do so. To get there, we've made a series of recommendations that we would like the government to action. So we'd like to see a fully comprehensive fleshed out plan led by the government working in partnership with the industry to address gender parity and wider diversity in transport. We'd like a campaign to profile and celebrate the diverse range of people within the transport sector who have kept the network going and who are helping the UK to build back better. Um, we'd like to support a cross, industry, a, a cross industry EDI charter to join up the different sector charters that exist. I think we've already referred to RIA and there's also women in aviation and women in maritime. And we'd like to commit to making the importance of greater diversity central to policy making and how the transport industry can support a safe green recovery from COVID-19. So industry also needs to play its part in providing clarity about flexible working practices. Uh, and we need to really see that built into the industry culture going forwards. We'd like to see women involved in policy making decisions and establish gender inclusive recruitment and retention policies and practices. The size of this prize is huge. Getting this right won't just put us, put us on a path to fairer and more innovative future. A new look model for our transport workforce could build capability and further boost the competitiveness of UK infrastructure on a global scale. So let's take this once in a generation opportunity to build back better. And that's it from me. Thank you very much, Andy. Thank you very much, Katie, for that. Um, I think it's great that we've got that input uh, once again not the first person today to talk about uh, diversity and, and i know women in transport have been doing some excellent work uh, from the point of view of the you know different surveys uh, of the sector uh, as well and I, and i don't think it's uh, i think it's work that doesn't get enough um, publicity actually and anything that we can do uh, at infrastructure intelligence to raise the profile of that work then we're obviously keen to do um, uh, I, I'm sure we'll come back to a, a number of the points that you raised in the discussion and also be interesting to 
you know, to get some of your insights as well about the future uh, and where things might go, particularly on the net zero side as well, because I know that's something that uh, Turner and Townsend uh, do a lot of work on um, as well. Anyway, we need to crack on because time is pressing. Uh, our next speaker is Paul Wilkes, who's a business service manager for FORS. For those of you that don't know it, FORS is the Fleet uh, Operator Recognition Scheme, which is a voluntary uh, scheme for fleet operators, uh, which aims to raise the level of uh, quality within fleet operations, uh, including improving uh, carbon footprints uh, and their environmental record uh, as well. Um, and we were keen to get a perspective from this sector uh, in, this, uh, in this webinar because it's an often overlooked area of construction, uh, the, the, the impact of uh, site-related transport, because obviously there's a lot of stuff that goes on the construction sites and that's got to be transported there and often that's not thought of and i'm sure paul is going to give um you know some of his insights into that sector but also i'm sure he's got views on the the, the, the broader issue of the future of transport as uh, as well so uh, paul uh, your turn next thanks andy and hi everyone um i'm really pleased to be here to talk to talk to you all today um and i hadn't actually planned to talk about the decarbonization of hgvs um, but more than happy to do so in the uh, in the chat at the end afterwards. Um, I don't think we've quite got no plan, um, although we probably do need the government to help us make some decisions in that area. <laughs> but anyway, so as Andy said, I, I work for the Fleet Operator Recognition Scheme, which is FORS, and we focus very much on road transport, which is what I want, I want to uh, talk about today and our experience of the pandemic and how the industry is adapting to a post-COVID world and I'm very much touching wood when I'm saying that, I have to say, uh, especially given the current situation. Um, and I think the, the global effects of the uh, pandemic have been momentous and devastating, um, so much so that probably in decades to come, generations and historians are going to look back on this period in the same way as we think of a, a world war or something like, along those, those, those lines. And many people have been forced to stop and take stock and review their priorities. And the same can be said of uh, attitudes towards transport operations and particularly the freight and logistics sector and after the onset of widespread lockdowns the general public and hopefully strategic planners as well have now become more aware that the movement of goods is an essential part of modern life as we know it after all if the freight industry and the wider supply chains had ceased working during the lockdowns supermarket shelves would have been unstocked hospitals would have run short of resources and tons of goods would have remained undelivered and the transport industry can be proud of what it's done and is continuing to do for us all. And at the start of the pandemic, when we entered the national lockdown, it was largely either boom or bust for transport operators. In the construction sector, with most sites closing and the government guidance around non-essential work, a large number of fleets ended up being mothballed. However, as I mentioned before, the supply chains for supermarkets, hospitals and online shopping retailers were working absolutely flat out and expanding their operations to keep up with the new demand. And in fact, we're growing the size of their fleets as quickly as they could. At Fours, we've got just under 5,000 members nationally, and our members are a really good barometer for the industry. And we've seen a slight decline in the number of members since the start of the pandemic. And a recent report has said that there are currently around 19,000 transport and logistics SMEs who are experiencing significant financial distresses, which is an increase of 24% compared to last year. And it's not really surprising in what's already a tough market, market with really tight margins. And we've been looking hard to support our members um, during this period. Um, through our accreditation scheme, we work with fleets to raise operating standards and make commercial vehicles safer, smarter and greener. And the national and regional lockdowns for us meant that we couldn't do any more site audits, which is a key part of the way that we, uh, we run the accreditation process, ensuring that operators meet the standards uh, that are required to come onto construction sites, for example. Uh, so like a lot of organisations, we had to innovate to keep supporting our customers. And our bronze uh, remote audit process had to be developed, piloted and rolled out using a combination of web conferencing and new online portals for uh, the uploading of evidence. And it was a real challenge for us to find the right technological solution to support all of our members. who can range from a single fleet operator right up to the large multinational fleets and they've all got very differing uh, technological capabilities. And while a remote audit can never completely replicate a site visit with its detailed interaction between the auditor and the operator, we've put in place a number of activities to protect the quality of the audits. 
And we've also now reintroduced site audits alongside remote audits to allow our members to choose either option. And it's really interesting that 20% of our members to date are still choosing to have the site audits rather than the uh, remote option. However, like opening Pandora's box, once you allow a new technology or a way of working um, into effect, it's impossible to put it to, to go back to the old ways uh, of working. And so we're also undertaking an extensive review to understand how to embrace the benefits that we're seeing from remote audits, while at the same time further mitigating any of the risks around it. And I think there's definitely been a, mind, a mindset shift for all of us around embracing technology to enable new ways of working during the pandemic. And this is bound to create lots of opportunities going forward. Another part of how we've been raising standards is by providing training. And for our driver and manager training, we launched the new Falls Professional, Pro Professional Virtual Classroom um, to ensure that our training could still be undertaken in an online environment. And this has proved to be very popular as a method of providing training as it reduces the amount of time attendees need to be away from their operation. And it's been supported by new technology that allows course attendees uh, to be able to see each other and the trainer, which makes the experience much more interactive. And the platform also includes an assessment at the end of each webinar to verify that the learning objectives have been met. And this also, interestingly, includes the ability to track if people are actually watching and engaging in the webinar and not just having it running in the background while they catch up on emails. Not that we believe anyone would do that, of course. Um, and a key training requirement for drivers meeting the full silver standard, which is what is required to drive onto construction sites, is safe urban driver training. And this is vulnerable road user training, where a driver spends half a day in the classroom learning about how to drive their truck safely in an urban environment. And then for the second half of the day, we put them on a bike and we send them out onto the roads in the city and scare the life out of them. Um, I mean, let them experience the roads from a cyclist viewpoint. Uh, it's really useful uh, tool for, for changing mindsets. Um, but due to the pandemic, we've had to relax the requirement for drivers to complete the on-cycle element until 2022. But this now means that there are thousands of drivers who are going to need to complete this training to keep their accreditation. And it's going to be tricky for them to fit that in as well as um, scaling up their operations and, and bringing, bringing everything back online again. We have looked at alternative learning methods, um, which can now be used uh, instead. And in 2020, we extended the training requirements to allow immersive interactive training to be used as an alternative to the on-cycle option. And that means that the training can now be, used, can now be approved to use drama-based multimedia, virtual reality, or other mixed reality techniques to help attendees understand the road from different perspectives. Now, at the moment, the virtual reality technology that we've looked at doesn't actually meet the requirements. But I think this, this, as this technology develops, um, it really could become a, a key benefit for helping to, drive, to train the drivers. And we've also been looking at how we include rural driving in our safety training to improve safety standards for HGVs going down country lanes. Because um, we're starting to see more and more sites opening up in rural locations, particularly with uh, HS2 going, going live. Uh, and that's really a, going to be ongoing concern for us, I think. So to bring my section to a close, in summary, uh, the coronavirus pandemic has opened the eyes of many people to the importance of transport operations and the freight and logistics sector at all scales, whether it be the multinational organisations transporting PPE to the local last mile deliveries ensuring people have, have been able to get the food and other necessities when they've needed them. It's now important that the transport industry uses this newfound exposure to its advantage, ensuring that the importance of the industry is reflected in future policy. Thank you all for your time. Back to you, Andy. Thanks very much, Paul, for that. And, and, and thanks very much for highlighting the importance of the freight sector, which I think is certainly a sector uh, that, you know, clearly in many ways has actually kept the country running uh, in the uh, in the recent uh, in the recent period. And again, I think it's something else that we haven't seen enough publicity on, um, notwithstanding the fact that, again, uh, running uh, the uh, Railway Industry Association a close second, I think, if my email inbox is uh, anything to go by the logistics sector uh, often send us quite a lot of information here at infrastructure intelligence and I think it's an area that we probably do need to pay increasing attention to going forward because of its importance in you know frankly keeping the country um, well running as I said and uh, really it's uh, it's been something that people just take for granted we all do don't we you know we go to the shop we pick up whatever we pick up we expect the deliveries to come in but we take it all 
uh, for granted. But nevertheless, a magnificent effort has gone on during the course of the pandemic when we were in full lockdown, let's not forget, to keep things actually uh, going. Um, so again, I think plaudits are definitely, are definitely due, uh, are definitely due there. Uh, anyway, um, our next speaker uh, is uh, Jamie Gordon from the um, Built Environment Communication Specialist BECG and our strategic partners and supporters for this uh, webinar series. Uh, Jamie is a director of infrastructure of energy, as I said before, and he has significant experience, 25 years experience, in fact, in strategic communications, and he's well used to working with the various stakeholders involved in infrastructure uh, projects. Uh, I know that Jamie's going to talk about uh, a number of issues uh, today, including uh, how he sees potential travel behaviours post-COVID, and also uh, what the potential shift in demographics might mean uh, going forward as well, because there's been a lot of talk about those, both in terms of living and working patterns and, and the effect that that might have uh, on transport, all worthy items, I think, for debate. And I'm sure Jamie will address some of those uh, when he speaks uh, right now. Jamie, over to you. Thanks very much, Andy, and welcome to everyone, wherever you may be, whatever time of day it is. And obviously, a lot of the topic we've been discussing so far today, the other speakers, has, has been COVID. And the pandemic has, understandably, had a drastic effect on transport. I mean, aviation has been all but non-existent. And for somebody that lives on the Heathrow flight path, rather selfishly, that has been a case of every cloud as a silver lining. Indeed, you know, fortunately, there's no planes going over now because you'd be hearing them probably. Um, but we heard some great news from David now how things are starting to creep back to normal. And um, the issue is, though, that we just really don't know what the long term effects will be, particularly on behavioural change and, and hence travel patterns. And will everyone, as many employers, including my own, are now allowing people to work from home from, for, let's say, two days a week, whatever the agreement is. Uh, but behavioural change is very fickle. It's really difficult to predict, and it, it's not so much the behavioural change that's difficult to predict, it's what the knock-on effects will be from that behavioural change. Um, and, you know, car ownership was predicted to be a major behavioural change back in the 60s, but the knock-on effect to that was massive. And if anyone remembers Dr Beeching, it's very easy to get wrong. So during the full lockdown, we saw a lot of this. We saw, uh, I mean, uh, the parents at my daughter's school, so many of them were saying that they were loving cycling and with the roads being empty, they definitely cycled back to the, uh, to the office when lockdown was over. And I saw loads of them on Wednesday when I dropped off my daughter walking off to the station, not a folding bicycle between them. So... The thing about behavioural change is it's easy when it's forced upon us. It's not really behavioural change. It's just adhering to the rules. And, uh, you know, you wouldn't say a smoker stopping smoking because he's on a flight has given up. Um, so when you remove those restrictions, most people will return to their previous ways. But then this is far more complex than that, since many people were actually being forced to go to an office five days a week. And we're saying potentially that won't be in place anymore. So if that isn't the case, we're really entering unknown territory when it comes to forecasting future traffic patterns and the, the usage. But for some people, the thing about working from home, it's, it's actually a bit of a luxury. I've been going into the office a, a day a week for the last six weeks. And basically, it's like walking into a, a disco. I mean, the average age must be about 68. And that's because 68, sorry, 28, we're not all that old, not like me. Uh, and that's because young people often don't have the space at home. Uh, and when you couple that with the fact that for, for many people at that age, work is a, a major part of their social life. I mean, after all, despite tin, a vast number of people still meet their partners at work in Indeed, I believe, Katie, you met your, your partner at work, so case in point. Um, so the challenge of transport now is the great unknown, and we hear, we're here to discuss future of transport in a way that 
probably hasn't been discussed since the invention of the internal combustion engine, and possibly more so. But the challenge isn't just due to COVID. Way over half a century ago, everyone was predicting pretty easily what was going to be needed. Uh, you know, we do a lot of con consultations where I work, uh, and we've done you know, new airports, ports, stations, motorways, and that's quite easy a concept to people under, for people to understand and, and for, for the communities to realize the needs case for these things. And while these infrastructure pieces are needed obviously for transport, the way transport delivery will interact with these pieces of infrastructure in the future will dramatically change. And that lack of clarity makes communicating their requirements quite challenging. Now, if we take the humble road as an example, communicating the need for dual carriageway has always been pretty obvious, really. It will reduce congestion, it will improve safety. And now with EVs, you know, the kind of future pollution issues slightly being reduced as a concern. But is congestion really going to be an issue in the future when you've got platooning? And how about safety issues with autonomous vehicles moving some of the concerns? How do you calculate if your highways England, your BCR, your benefit cost ratio for the road that's due to open in 2025, let's say, when you don't know what the take up of these new technologies is likely to be? And, and I know Mike mentioned digital and AI and how that can be used, but the flip side to that is, is AI is progressing so far is the solution to the way that people interact with their transport needs, that there is a lag between designing something now and when it's going to be operational. And that's very, very challenging because for anyone that's been involved on a, a linear project, and, and we've done many from HS2 to various Highways England jobs, whenever you do a linear project, you can bet your bottom dollar, somebody along that route will be an ex-engineer, a lawyer, somebody who wants to prove how knowledgeable they are. And they, along with the usual uh, groups, anti-groups that form, will no doubt spend days, even weeks, scrutinizing every part of any application. And it's at examination stage, the, the planning inspector will hear, probably in depth, a huge attack on any figures, traffic modeling, BCRs. So the question has to be for the sector, what kind of level of tolerance do we believe will be acceptable at that level of examination? And if you throw into the mix the fact that the net zero, we've mentioned net zero, it creates loads of new technologies and many of those will be unexpected as well. Let's think about airports. Um, hopefully smaller, electric, quieter planes could mean extended takeoff and landing times, or even allow Uber to fulfill that dream they've had of little metro airport hubs where you can go to and take off from a roof and then be transported to a, a major airport just outside the city center. Those technologies and other technologies such as AI could allow public transport to be utilized at a totally different level. I mean, you could have public transport as the solution, the logistics solution for that elusive last mile, um, with maybe your Amazon delivery being delivered to the bus that you're going to get on to get home. And it could also, AI could revolutionize car sharing as well. So, you know, transport modeling is going to be extremely difficult. And if we look at the last of these, I really believe car sharing and things like this, well, you can kind of forget the concept of a petrol head. Um, and not because of the end of international uh, of, uh, combustion engines. Transportation used to be as much about the journey. Uh, you couldn't do much uh, of going from A to B. Hence, you know, the love of sports cars and motorbikes, the journey became the whole experience. But really now with Generation X, that is an alien concept to them because not being in the office or at home doesn't mean you can't do what you want to. They can be on their phones, they can be checking the Instagrams, they can be checking TikTok. And so the concept of enjoying the perfect turn in at an apex in an MGB roadster is totally alien to them. 
that's something they can do on Grand Theft Auto without massive insurance costs. So for them, car ownership is a ridiculous concept and possibly only contemplatable in the more rural locations. In the UK, for instance, uh, young adults at 17 to 20 with driving license fell by 40% since 1990. And the average age for starting a family is much later now. So that major trigger need for having a car is, is more now in their 40s. So if you look again at that, that benefit cost ratio and the drop in car ownership, it's going to be really, really tricky when you're looking at AI and, and ride, ride sharing car clubs and various other things. So what's going to be around the corner? I mean, what's the next uber amazing delivery? Who knows? And the ramifications are huge. There's a big drive to get EV charging points in, but do you really need it when the next generation won't actually bother having a car until they hear the pitter patter of tiny feet? And when they have that, they're more likely to move away from the city. So could the only be that the biggest uptake in EV ownership is actually in rural communities where more people have driveways and the ability to charge at home anyway. So could the whole EV charging point actually be a bit of a myth? And as long as you've got enough charging points in cities for the Ubers to charge, then you're absolutely fine. Again, back to a kind of potential Dr. Beeching situation. But again, it's even more complex than that. Um, because if you look then at the uptake of EVs in rural extremities, and the need to decarbonize domestic heat in those areas, the extremities of the grid will be under so much constraint. And transport isn't going to be just about vehicles, infrastructure, road and rail. It's going to be as much about electricity grids, energy storage, obviously EVs as a solution there, and connectivity. For instance, Network Rail are the biggest user, single user of electricity in the UK. And I think there's some prediction that HS2, if it's fully built out, would be number two. And there's great initiatives there. I don't know if anyone's aware of riding sunbeams. It's an idea to drive traction through trackside solar. But still, electricity, there's a huge requirement for green energy, and transport will be a major draw. So we need to plan in not just transport solutions, but grid solutions as well. And sustainability will be a far greater player. There's, there's no doubt about that. Here, the French are somewhere ahead of us. I, I, I don't know, well, we, none of us have probably been to France recently, but many travel tickets actually have the carbon footprint of that journey printed on the back of them. And infrastructure projects are going to be the same. We're going to be accountable for the whole carbon footprint covering both operation construction, all the way through our supply chain. So now all that may sound like the challenge is huge, being rather pessimistic, and there's no doubt the future is not going to be easy. Projects are going to be far more difficult to justify. We'll have to be far more robust in our numbers and design solutions. We'll have to take into account more factors, potentially making things may be far more creative, and surely that's a good thing. The transport sector will no longer just be about tarmac and silt. It will be as much about applications, AI, automation. And hopefully you'll agree with me. That does sound rather exciting. So thank you very much. Thanks very much, Jamie, for that. And some interesting insights, uh, maybe sort of challenging received wisdom around things like electric vehicles. Um, which is uh, particularly interesting to me because I've actually got to speak uh, on uh, EV and net zero um, at a Syria event in a couple of weeks' time. So um, it, it, it's really interesting to see how some of the recent events have actually, you know, maybe forced us to think a little bit differently about what our received wisdom was on some of these, uh, you know, some of these issues um, and maybe the rush to um, fit in EV charging points, you know, in every community maybe isn't uh, the priority that we thought it was. I think, you know, you, what the points you made there about the demographics of young people in particular, um, who just are not interested, it seems to me, in many ways, uh, about getting cars, uh, you know, which, um, you know, as the, 
stepdad to a, a 21 year old is music to my ears anyway because it's easy put me hand in my pocket but you're right i mean i think you know people um aren't maybe as interested at that age as they were before and i think it does highlight the importance as well of having a sensible sustainable and robust uh, public transport system uh, and obviously central to that um is is is, is rail in particular uh, and I just want to turn, first of all, uh, in the uh, in the question uh, part of the, the discussion part of today's event, uh, back to uh, David, just on that issue. In your conversations with government, and I'm sure you've had some in the recent period, is there a recognition uh, on, on, on the part of government uh, in relation to the rail sector in particular uh, of the, if you like, the, the net zero and the green imperative and the difference that the rail sector can make to that. Is that coming out in your conversations uh, with government, David? Um, yes, but not yet as clearly and strongly as we'd like. Um, I think we probably, many on the call will be aware that the whole transport sector is waiting, eagerly awaiting a thing called uh, the Transport Decarbonisation Plan. And, um, you know, that's been delayed, uh, you know, for COVID and other reasons. Um, it's the rumor would have it. It's you know it might be uh, weeks or low months away. You know, um, um, and what that will do for all modes, which is really really important, is um, is set the government's ambition for each of the modes. And I think from that we get a framework against where against which each mode can uh, can can start to start to plan. Um, you know, we're expecting that to to look for rail to become uh, net zero by 20, 2050 in England and Wales, and Scotland have already decided uh, that they want net zero by 2045, and they've got actually some pretty, you know, uh, detailed plans about how they're going to do that for rail, uh, you know, which is really encouraging. So, you know, it, it sh and rail is uh, is quite fortunate, um, as I alluded to before, that we have technical solutions, uh, a rolling program of electrification and fleet orders of battery and hydrogen trains. So what are we we're calling for? Uh, we have we have solutions and that allows, uh, you know, in the case of Scotland, people to start doing some strategic strategic planning. Uh, but, you know, Jamie, Jamie's right, uh, you know, there, it is going to be difficult uh, for all transport modes to to make their business cases. You know, we've got the recent experience of um, uh, numbers being down, certainly on public transport because of COVID. And we've got all of the kind of uncertainties and, 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 and new factors that uh, Jamie alludes to. But I think what in my mind, what it does mean is that public transport, whether it's rail or other modes, has got to be the absolute core of a low carbon economy. And to jump to Williams, if I was to paraphrase Williams, the two challenges for the rail industry there, there are make the industry more attractive for the user, particularly the passenger, um, but also freight, um, because as I say, the most useful thing we can do is modal shift. So number one is make ourselves a more attractive, user-friendly, uh, modern um, uh, customer experience. Um, and uh, the second is cost. And uh, you know, the undercurrent, quite rightly, in Williams is that the industry needs to uh, needs to cost less. Thanks. Thanks for that. On this public transport piece. Um, one of the things that comes to my mind is something that was raised in the chat is throughout the pandemic, um, I think it's raised, obviously raised a lot of issues, but in relation to uh, transport as a whole, uh, has it, do you think, accelerated the, um, the need and the pursuit for a more intelligent and integrated transport infrastructure than maybe we've got at the moment? Is it, is it high time that we started thinking more about how we joined all this stuff up. Um, David, sorry, um, Mike, uh, what's your view on that? It's, um, thanks Andy. It's a really, really big question that's been asked and, and one that we've certainly reflected on uh, within, within Atkins. I think one of the things that we have to remind ourselves of is that transport's a derived demand 
So what I mean by that is that there has been some fundamental shifts in the demand uh, and the way that we, so the way that we work, we've talked about already, um, you know, the flexibility we've got, uh, the way that we shop online, um, and also even online education and stuff. So, you know, in, in, in my view, that, that's a fundamental shift. And I think some of that will and uh, will will play out in terms of um, what then um, people do in terms of their requirements and needs for, for transport itself. But one of the one of the things that does that, that really sort of st uh, stuck out uh, to me are the recent announcements uh, that we've had from government really is around that flexibility that we're all going to need. Um, we're going to need a much more flexible sort of ticketing policy on the rail and on the bus network and, you know, the, 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 the requirement for multi-modal uh, um, uh, ticketing as well is, is signposted in both the National Bus Strategy and in the uh, William Schatz uh, review. So for me, you know, we can see some big moves happening there. Um, it, it, but the other, the, other, the other one as well is, I think, on the sustainable uh, transport, on the active travel uh, front, we saw some significant shifts over COVID. Will they last? Will they be uh, long-term changes? Uh, my, my gut feel is that certainly the, the younger generation, generation coming through, um, are, are going to be much more prone to using cycling and walking as, as modes, perhaps than the older generation. So that's that's, that's definitely a shift. And, and from my personal you know, perspective, and I'm sure people on this call as well, as I do cycle and do walk more, now as a result of COVID. Um, so, you know, there have been some, some changes. It will, it is a long-term, um, you know, um, uh, process of change, as we've all talked about, behavioural change doesn't happen overnight, but certainly COVID has certainly made people reflect on what they're doing and how they're going about doing it, which then creates the demand that has changed as a result. Thanks, thanks for that, Mike. Um, just want to turn to Katie. Um, um, partly on that integration piece, but also maybe just broadening it out a bit more. Um, have you got any thoughts on uh, one of the things I'm seeing, particularly in our local area, uh, that, you know, when people get frustrated about transport, they talk about, well, if only we had a tram system or a light rail system. And, you know, it's often a bit of a sort of a fantasy transport game that people can play. You know, if only we had that, be much more, um, you know, appropriate and convenient. You know, do, do you have any thoughts? And again, this is one that's been raised in the chat by Joshua Scholes. Any thoughts on the future for light rail um, and, and, and maybe some of the, the more imaginative bus rapid transit schemes that we see, the track stuff? Is that something that you see developing going forward? Or do you think there might be, you know, maybe even we might be less creative because of, of, of potentially less usage going forward? What do you think about that? So actually, so it's a really interesting point. And one of the themes that I think has just definitely has come across through everybody's talks is about the point about how we're going to integrate all of this together. So um, so speaking with my kind of my women in transport hat on, um, absolutely, um, I I absolutely believe that there's something in around. Um, uh, and for me, uh, if I'm being honest, a little bit about the Williams review didn't quite didn't quite hit the mark for from the diversity perspective on is that we really really need to get much more diversity into the workforce so that you can generate more innovation the innovation and the ideas and the different thinking is going to come from from having a much more diverse workforce so one of the things that um and you know talking there about lots of different uh, different uh, ways of traveling uh, light rail whether it be more active travel um absolutely i think these are all things that could be uh, that need to be considered in the future um uh, more so than light rail actually the active travel has been a really interesting one from the uh, from the women in transport perspective um you know a lot of concerns have been raised about um you know uh, women in particular taking up cycling um, it has improved throughout the throughout the pandemic but we've still got a, a, a long way to go um, and um, and again you know um, yes most definitely I think there is a lot of scope for 
um, you know, for, for light rail, for just for different ways of thinking. Um, and, uh, you know, and I think, Jane, you were touching on it there and saying, actually, I think we need to be really careful as well. You know, let's really use the data that we've got already to try and work out what the what the future might look like. Um, but you know, equally, can't, we can't make any rash decisions around you know what we think might might be needed next, um, or you find yourself in another beaching situation. So, uh, so uh, uh, you know, certainly from my perspective, I would say yes, most definitely, we do need to be thinking about tram and light rail um, as different modes of transport, but actually it's broader than that. I think we just need the, we need the, the fresh thinking and the innovation um, coupled with the decarbonisation and the digitalisation to actually get to the right answer. Thanks for that, Katie. Just want to turn to Paul Wilkes for a second, going back to the, the freight issue, but also, um, you know, looking, thinking about it from the point of view of construction organisations, and, and also the social value uh, piece as well. Um, do you see um, in, in, in the work that you do, working with um, organisations and clients, uh, is there an understanding from them about the social value impact of, 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 of the transport that they use on site? Is that something that you can help them with? Is that something that you think that they're even conscious of? Yeah, it's something that we're seeing, it's becoming a stronger and, and stronger pool, I have to say. Um, initially, when we started um, running fours, the, the, the strength was very much around safety and trying to make sure that, you know, they, they, there was a lot of uh, realisation that um, within a construction site, there are, there are a lot of health and safety requirements and lots of processes and procedures put in place to make sure all the workers on site were are, uh, are safe and looked after but actually um, there wasn't a lot of thought um, put to the vehicles and they're pretty big vehicles sometimes um, coming to and from the sites and so now there's a lot of work being done to look to see how they mitigate them and making them use schemes like fours which which require the drivers to have extra training require the vehicles to have extra safety equipment on them as well um, so that's the safety side of things, but but also um, of recent years, there's also been a, a larger drive towards the um, zero emissions as well. Um, and so people are looking at whether or not there's alternative ways that they can get their their um, freight to site. So you've got things like um, in London where you've got the Tideway project, where actually they've um, they're bringing a lot of the concrete rings in by train, and then the last mile is done by water. And that's really helpful if you happen to have your site next to. Um, a river, but that's not always the case. Um, so you do, you you know, the, there often is the requirement for having um, your vehicles um, make doing that last mile of delivery, and it's trying to understand how to do that in the safest possible way. And they will do work looking at the routes that these vehicles will be taking, particularly um, any any um, oversized vehicles, um, to make sure that they are avoiding key um, kind of vulnerable road user areas, such as. Um, any of the uh, any going past schools at, at key times, or similarly, um, you know, left-hand turn is often where um, these vehicles cause cause the, you know come into the the biggest conflict with cyclists, for example. So they'll look at how they uh, can reroute vehicles coming in and give a prescribed route that doesn't require any left turns. So you, you're removing that blind spot from the from the driver's journey. So th there's a lot of work going on from that. Thanks, thanks very much, uh, David. I just want to turn to Jamie for a second. Um, um, it, it seemed to me from, you know, some of the recent announcements um, around, um, you know, the government's infrastructure plans, um, that there, there still seems to be quite an emphasis on road building, when it seems to me that more public transport is probably more logical, and certainly if we get it right, more environmentally friendly. What's your view on that? Um, I and mean, one thing we haven't touched upon about transport is it's hugely political. Um, and, you know, the, the old adage that buses are red and cars are blue, to a certain extent, is still true. Uh, and indeed, you know, in case was talking about light rail, light rail is probably the most politically fought battleground uh, going on, mainly because, of course, it tends to be urban and mainly because a lot of the urban situations we find ourselves in have metro mayors. So we've, we've seen, you know, recently a change in the metro mayor and a change in the proposed 
uh, light rail or guided busway, whatever solution being proposed in one of the major city centres. Um, and few city centres have, have pulled it off unless they have had a Metro Mayor who's had a number of terms behind them uh, to actually pull these things off. I think the, the drive for, for, for road is an interesting one. It's a safe bet because of as what I was talking about early on. Um, the traditional uh, battleground over road has been you know, noise, air pollution and things like that. And as an issue, that is going away because everyone can argue that, especially with the new targets, uh, the predicted air qual issues when EVs kick in um, go out the window, excuse the pun. But um, so I can see why the existing um, administration is pushing roads. It fits very much into their um, voter profile. But it's also something that they can talk about as, as investment in quite a, 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 a quick turnaround. As we know, you know, rail takes time, an awful long time. Um, getting a road in place is a lot quicker. And so the benefits of that are seen within a shorter political sphere. And I think we have to, we have to be honest that that is often the trigger for decisions being made at treasury level for where the investment goes. Thanks, um, thanks, Jamie. Um, again, I'm gonna go back to rail for a second then and I wanna come back to, um, I wanna come back to active transport, which has, has definitely hit the headlines during the course of the pandemic, but just briefly turn it to rail. Um, one of the things that um, particularly up here where I'm logging on from in the Northeast uh, are, are conscious about is some of the government's announcements recently about resurrecting disused railway lines. Um, some of them, as, as you know, that have, have been you know disused for many many years. Is that is that a real thing as far as you're concerned, uh, David, or do you think it's a publicity stunt? Uh, no, it's 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 very much a, it's very much a real thing. I mean, Oakhampton. It's not in the north; it's in the southwest. But Oakhampton is the first line that's going to be reopened. I mean, some would say uh, it was or you know it wasn't really closed; it was still serving uh, freight traffic. But there's been 14 miles of track relayed in, um, in the past couple of months. Uh, it will be open soon. Um, the uh, um, Blythe and Tyne uh, through Ashington is uh, definitely on the stocks. Um, and, you know, that's a great collaboration uh, between the uh, uh, County Council and Network Rail and other partners. Um, and what's, uh, you know, what's good about that is ultimately uh, what, what Ashington must be 12, 15 miles out of Newcastle, yet it's really, really difficult for young people without their own transport to get into, you know, to get from what is frankly a socially deprived area to an area of high unemployment. So it's just socially a brilliant scheme. And the other thing that's really good about it is it's been going through um, the project speed process, uh, which is, you know, Jamie's right, rail things take a long time traditionally. But we're going to knock a couple of years off the off the program by just going about it in a uh, in a different and, and less bureaucratic way. Um, so yes, it's definitely happening. Whether all the many schemes, because I I've, I've lost track. I mean, I think there might be, uh, you know, it, the number of schemes that have been proposed is in the dozens. And clearly, um, I think it might be as many as fifty. And clearly, they're not all going to fly. Um, and um, but. The, the, there are some very deserving cases. Uh, I've given a couple of examples. Thanks, David. Um, Jamie mentioned the, the P word earlier on, um, uh, and I knew he would, um, politics. Uh, and I think it is, it, it, I think one of the things for me looking at, at, at transport in the round is it's all well and good. At, I mean, because it's often been mentioned in relation to levelling up as well, hasn't it? You know, if only we can get the right transport into the right places, East West Rail Link, all the rest of it. Um, you know, sort of, um, you know, decent bus routes and all the rest of it. What about cost in all of this? I know traditionally our industry doesn't necessarily get involved with end user with, with comments about end user cost, but at the end of the day, if transport's going to be used to the extent 
that we want it to be used, and particularly sustainable transport, surely it's got to be a lot cheaper than what it is at the moment. Um, and I'd be interested in what the panel's views are on that, uh, because it seems to me that unless we get that right, and obviously government will have a role to play in that, particularly in those sectors where it's subsidising transport, and it's doing that in a lot of ways, in fact, almost exclusively throughout the pandemic. What's our view on that? Or do we just build it and not worry about it being used? I can't believe we do that. So I'm going to throw that one first uh, at Katie Holland, And then just so he can gather his thoughts, I'm going to ask uh, for Mike's views on that second. So Katie, cost. What's cost. your view on that? Right. Yes. So yeah, quite relevant this week, isn't it? I mean, um, yeah, firstly, I mean, the, uh, I think rather than Rather than cost, perhaps talking in terms of affordability, um, and uh, both both from uh, I speak there both from TNT's perspective and from Women in Transport that uh, I think I think that's one thing you know two, both organisations would agree on that affordability is absolutely critical. Um, from the Women in Transport perspective, most definitely uh, we really welcome the flexible ticketing arrangements that are being brought in, um, and again sort of with a slant of rail there. Um, but also as well, um, you know, I experienced it myself this week. There's going to be much, much, uh, passengers are going to be much, much uh, kind of, uh, I, I, you know, I can't think what the word is, but, you know, it, there's a lot more choice going to be available to us. So um, so being able to deliver, you know, the enhancements and improvements a lot more effectively and efficiently is going to be absolutely critical. So, um, and that's not about cutting corners either. That's about delivering more efficiently. So, um, so yeah, you know, certainly really welcome things like being able to, you know, being, being able to afford being able to pay for the transport. Women have been disproportionately affected on this over the longer period of time anyway, because we've been needing to, uh, flexible travel is something that we've needed for a long time. So um, really, so really welcome that. Um, but yes, keeping those costs down, otherwise we're going to be in Ubers instead. So, um, you know, the choice is opening up. Uh, Mike, I said I was going to turn to you. I'm turning yeah. to you, your view on cost. Okay, well, I know just to uh, absolutely uh, agree with what Katie said, the affordability is going to be uh, key. I think for me, uh, the observation that I've got is really one that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, is that, you know, the demands fundamentally shifted. So that does enable more flexibility uh, in when, when and how we travel. And at the end of the day, the operators would say, well, cost comes down as well to the demand and supply um, curve in economics. So if you can flatten out that curve, then you can actually make uh, available more choices, um, which Katie's, you know, sort of already really talked about, which will reduce the cost to people using the network and hopefully make it much more attractive. And I think you're right, you know, affordability is the key. I've worked in, you know, previously in local uh, authority and, you know, the cost of um, actually using bus and, and so on was, was, was a key uh, feedback that, you know, I've had, and that goes back many years. So yeah, so but I do think through the, the just the shift in what, what's happened in the travel demand and so on, the flexibility is there. So we should start to see some real movements there. We've already seen that from government, so that's going to be hugely welcome. Thanks for that. Uh, I'm going to come to 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 David next with this question, but just before I do, just so that you can get your um your your uh, brain cogs moving around, what will be the last question uh, of the event? And the last question is going to be, I, I want our panelists succinctly and briefly to give me one thing uh, that we don't have at the minute or do now, or it could be a project, it could be a way of doing transport that you think we should be doing going forward. If there's one thing, and that could be, you know, lessons learned from the pandemic, or it could be anything, but what's the one thing initiative uh, that, you know, that, that, that we should have, it could even be a project, you know, and don't say, you know, I want a light rail system from my back door to the, uh, to the local gym or whatever. We're not having that, but you know what I mean? So just get thinking about that. Uh, and I'll ask that as the last question. Don't answer that next. I'll tell you when to answer that question. Coming back to the cost issue, there is a perception, possibly unfairly or not, that rail is expensive. So how do we get over that, uh, David? And, 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 and coming back to that point that I made, you know, how do we make sure that actually um, transport is affordable, particularly if we're going to be opening up all these new rail lines? Yeah, thanks, Andy. Um, I, I think Katie's response about the importance is about uh, affordability is, is, is really, really important. The, you know, we mentioned the P word for politics uh, before. The... Um, Previous uh, governments over the last 15 years or so 
uh, of, of both of both parties have been steadily shifting the cost of rail uh, towards the uh, fair pair. Um, and, you know, the argument behind that is that, uh, you know, there's something like less than 10% of daily journeys are on rail. So why should the 100% of the taxpayers pay for it? And there's, and there's you know, there's, there's, there's logic to that. But if you want to drive behaviour uh, change, and I think we're all agreed that we want to drive behaviour change uh, in the future, and there's a whole segment of the population, whether they're young people who choose not to have cars or uh, whether they're uh, people who live in uh, you know, rural areas who simply can't, you know, or, 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 or less affluent areas who can't afford cars, um, then um, we ought to have a, a decent public transport backbone for, for our, uh, you know, uh, for, for the benefit of UK PLC. And if you look at the kind of um, wider social benefits that major transport schemes, uh, so the transport for the north um, 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 estimate of the, the benefits, and I'm trying to remember it's something like a hundred billion um, um, benefit and 850,000 jobs uh, from, and that's transport as a whole, that's not just rail. Northern Powerhouse Rail is a subset of that. And Northern Powerhouse Rail alone will take 58,000 uh, uh, cars off the road. So I'm not making a political point, um, but um, you know, in the absence of things like road pricing, we haven't exactly got a um, you know a level playing field to drive um, to not drive behavior, but to 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 make people make rational economic decisions. So um, on the other side of cost is the one I've already alluded to, uh, which the industry is very conscious of, is that um, the other you know the other way that we uh, reduce the f fair price is we become more efficient as an industry in, in delivering uh, at lower cost. And that's something that the industry is uh, you know, very focused on. Thanks very much. Um, thanks very much, David. We've actually, unfortunately, we've run out of time. This is always the way on these things. I'm going to have to move to that last question now. So um, what is that one? And it can only be one, unfortunately, or one initiative, one key lesson, and be as brief as you can in answering it. And I'm going to go round the room, starting with the person who happens to be underneath me on the screen, and that's Paul Wilkes. Paul. Thanks, Andy. I think um, for me, I would like to see as we develop new technology for um, HGVs to move away from the diesel vehicle, that we, we combine the, the pillars of vision zero and carbon zero so that we design vehicles that um, aren't just focused on, on having the diesel engine at the front and can take into account the fact that you need greater visibility to improve um, safety for vulnerable road users. Good answer and very succinct. That's what we want, Mike. <laughs> I'll try and be as succinct. I think for me, it's, it's grabbing the once in a lifetime opportunity that we've got really to redefine what normal looks like together. That, for me is the number one and that's a behavioural, it's a government, it's a collective um, action really for me that we do that and we don't try and go backwards from, from where we, we are at the moment. Thanks very much. Um, Katie? Yep, a nice and simple one from me. Um, we really want that comprehensive, fully fleshed out plan from government and industry on diversity and transport. Um, we think that will make a big difference. Great stuff. Um, and David? Um, I want a plan too. I want a 30 year transport plan uh, that uh, sets out how we're going to decarbonize uh, the industry and it also smooths out the boom and bust which all segments of the uh, um, supply chain for transport suffer from which makes us unnecessarily inefficient so we could deliver more transport for the, uh, for the public's pound if we got that right. Excellent. And finally, just to wrap things up, uh, Jamie, what's your one thing that you'd like to see that you think we need to see? I think smarter, more creative funding and billing models, particularly if you look at EVs, I worry that an old age pensioner will be paying the same for her electricity as the man charging his Rolls Royce in the driveway. We need to change the way it works and maybe, you know, weight of the car 
might be that's that covers maintenance of the roads and particular pollution we've got to be creative thanks very much and a really important point to finish on there i think both in terms of creativity which our industry i'd like to think has in spades if you pardon the pun and also um that whole question of affordability i think as well it's come up again uh, at this particular event that you know the whole question of that you know what is value social value around uh, the issue of transport and i think that, again that's something that we will return to uh, in the future as uh, as well but as i said before we've run out of time i'd just like to thank all of our panelists uh, mike uh, batherham from atkins david clark from the railway industry association katie holland uh, from women in transport paul wilkes uh, from fours and as ever jamie gordon director of infrastructure and energy at the communication built environment communication specialists becg uh, and our strategic partner for this uh, and indeed all of our um, friday morning webinar uh, events thank you to you all um, and it only remains for me to say uh, to our audience thank you for logging on today uh, do check the website for uh, the details of future um infrastructure intelligence live events and i know we've got one coming up in a couple of weeks which will go on the website next week uh where we've got an interview with the commercial director for the uk's new hospital program so that'll be an interesting one uh to uh, to log in for um it, particularly if you work in that uh, area of social uh, infrastructure so hopefully we'll see everybody on that uh apart from that just have to wish everybody a, uh, for those of you that have got it, uh, a long uh, bank holiday weekend. Hopefully the sun will shine where you are. Thanks again to everybody for taking part, to our panellists and to our attendees. Thanks very much indeed, and we'll see you again uh, soon. So bye-bye, everybody. Thank bye, you. Everyone.